Today we will finish covering the paperback to hardcover conversion and then I'll look at some simple foil finishing techniques that can be done with minimal tools. I want the spine leather to wrap about a quarter of a way onto the book. So I'll work that out and that's from the outside of the spine. I'll add a few millimetres for overlap of the board cloth and then I'll round it up to 40 millimetres. And then I'll use a piece of leather similar to what I'm going to use to cover the spine to measure the width of the leather that I'm going to need. I'll do that over one of the bands for the widest point. There was a lot of discussion about this technique after the first video, so I just want to emphasize that this approach isn't meant for preserving or restoring or repairing uh, paperbacks. It's an aesthetic thing. It's really only suitable for uh, paperbacks or soft covers that have sound bindings that are likely to last. One of the complications with this project is the use of PVA instead of wetting out the leather and using paste and trying to get the leather down over the spine bands and into the joint grooves as well. So I'm going to use a trick that I've seen used for leather case bindings where a, a mould is made to hold the leather down between the bands and then I'll use that at the same time as I use some knitting needles to hold the leather down in the joint grooves. So I'm making this tool that will hold the leather down between the bands. I'm giving a good millimetre or more either side of the bands for the width of the leather but you don't want to make it too sloppy otherwise you may end up with some leather that's not adhered to the spine tube. Now in a moment I'm going to use my finger as a brush which is just pure laziness. I didn't want to reach all the way across to the other bench for my my glue brush. Uh, if you're going to be exposed to PVA a lot in your bindery uh, you should read your MSDS on your adhesive. I really wasn't having a good week last week. My computer crashed while I was importing files from my camera and I lost hours of video and pretty much will have to start again on a project, what was going to be my next project and it's a reasonably complex project. And then the leather I was using for covering this spine, which I'd bought as bookbinding leather, uh, turned out to have characteristics that aren't compatible with bookbinding. So I think this leather has a coating on it. It wasn't taking the gold foil later and its handling characteristics when I put it on the spine just it didn't match the normal bookbinding leather I get from this company. It's kangaroo. So it just made this project a lot more difficult than it needed to be or should have been. And this demonstrates why life is a lot easier if you use materials that is designed for bookbinding. So if you're in North America or England, uh, you have easy access to uh, bookbinding leather that's much more expensive if you have to import it to other countries. So I highly recommend using uh, those sources for leather. Now I'm going to quickly edge pair this. If you don't want to edge pair, then uh, you don't have to, if you're using leather that's less than a millimetre thick, then you can just fill in on the cover. So uh, fill in with a card about the same thickness as the leather uh, so that you don't see that transition uh, of the leather underneath the board cloth. So I'm just marking where the head and tail of the book is going to be because you do want to thin the leather at this spot because we're going to double that up when we do the turn in and we really want the leather at that spot to add up to one thickness. So we sort of need to get rid of half of it sort of thing. I'm using my French paring knife here uh, but if you don't have one of those then uh, just use sandpaper. So I'll show that in a moment. 
so you don't need a fancy knife like this. Uh, instead of uh, working on a stone, just put a piece of grey board underneath it and then sand it down to about half thickness or turn it over on itself so that you can't uh, check that you can't feel that ridge where the edge of the leather will be under the turn in. So I'll put the marks back where the head and tail will be and the center of the leather uh, in preparation for gluing. Now I get a bit lazy here. I uh, put this uh, waxed paper or, or baking paper underneath to protect the, the paste downs where the gaps are at the head and tail. You should really take more time than I did because I ended up gluing the tubes shut again. So uh, put, uh, take a bit more care with that step than I did. Now I'm gluing both the uh, book and the leather because I, with PVA you sort of got one shot so you really want this to adhere. It's a lot easier working with leather uh, and paste. But I'm doing this on the basis that a lot of people aren't used to working with paste and leather. So um, that's the thinking behind using PPA. So for a start, I'm just going to get the leather on the book and uh, get it down over the spine. And then I'll do the turn-ins later. So I'll just pull it down over those bands. Use a, a bone folder to start shaping it across the bands. Uh, I'll use a band nipper here, but if you don't have band nippers, then um, just do the best you can with your bone folder. Um, some people use things called band sticks as well. And now the trick is to try and get this leather down in the grooves uh, and between the bands. So I'm going to put them behind or between some pressing boards and then put another board at the front and then use that little tool to press the leather down between the bands all at the same time. And then I'm going to sit here and hold it for five or so minutes, which is a bit tedious, uh, but I couldn't think of a, another easy way of doing that. So I didn't do that for just 10 seconds. I actually held it there for a good five minutes at least. And then I just put it in the press with the knitting needles in place for an hour or so. Now I'm going to really regret not uh, tearing a few small pieces of baking paper and protecting the tops of the edges of the tubes because now they're glued shut. So, I, and I've glued them pretty good shut too. So I'm going to have to muck around with them a fair bit. I'll use my micro spatula to open them up. It would have just been better to not glue them shut in the first place just seemed to match the week I was having. So the next step is to do the turn-ins. Now turn-ins with PVA uh, aren't a lot of fun because you've really got to get them first, first go and the, the leather sticks and it, it's hard to move it around. So uh, just do the best you can and um, uh, get it as quickly in place as quickly as possible. Uh, much easier with uh, paste because you have the time. I think on one of my recent projects, maybe the sign board binding, I actually used mix right at the spine. And that's an option as well to just give yourself a little bit more time to uh, do the turn in. The other downside of not wetting out the leather is that you can't really mold a head cap. Now, I don't remember wetting out the leather on my prototype, but I must have because I actually molded quite nice little head caps on that. But uh, I wasn't able to mold head caps on this at all. I do put a cord around the book and uh, try and shape the head caps a little bit, but uh, the, the leather just didn't really want to do anything for me. You'll have noticed that the leather went onto one side of the book further than the other. Now I'm going to fix that up now. I'm going to measure in from the fore edge, the same on each side. So there'll be more leather covered on one side than the other. And if I'd filled that in underneath the 
covering cloth. Now you could use paper as well, you don't need to use cloth. I used paper, a paste paper on my prototype. Uh, if you filled in uh, underneath the covering material, uh, you wouldn't notice at all that one side has slightly more leather under the covering material than the other. As I mentioned earlier, this approach isn't really appropriate for repairing a paperback. If you do have a paperback that's falling apart, uh, you really want to remove the old adhesive. Uh, and sometimes the easiest way to do that is just to guillotine off the spine. You really only have to lose about a millimeter of paper. Uh, and in the long run, that millimeter was probably so damaged anyway it had to go. So remove, pull the book apart, apart completely so you've got a heap of single uh, leaves and then it's a matter of just doing a double fan or a lumbecking and then putting it into something like a, a, a bradle case. So I've got uh, videos on that. So it's fairly straightforward to repair a paperback uh, into a hardcover uh, by doing a double fan or a lumbeck and then putting a case on it. And this is a fairly common repair that I do for people. It's actually a rebind. So people have a sentimental book. It's a soft cover. Uh, I'll remove all the adhesive off the spine. I'll do a lumbeck. I'll make a case for it. And then I'll put the original covers on the case. I'll nip it really well so it'll be... Uh, pushed down into that case quite nicely. Uh, I'll have covered them, the case with a matching material to the original covers and, and it really looks quite nice. The original covers are preserved and often it looks like it was meant to be that way, that it's the hardcover version of that book. Often manuals, people will bring manuals in, uh, car manuals, that sort of stuff. Uh, and they're falling to pieces because they're being used in a shop uh, and uh, that's the approach I take with those. It's not glamorous work but it's sort of the bread and butter of the small book binder. So the original plan was to show a bit of basic finishing for this book with foil including making the label but everything was starting to go wrong at this point. So I'm going to try and salvage some of the footage so this is me setting up a chase with the title which I'll put in the blocking machine. I really dislike this chase because it doesn't have sides but it's what I've got. And then the next problem I find is that I've run out of the red leather that I use for labels so I have to start using some scraps which I'm not particularly happy about. Then I go to put some lines on the boards and the foil just will not stick to the leather. And that's when I decide this leather must have a coating on it. And then I spent two hours with a very fine, sharp uh, scalpel scraping the coating off where the lines are going to go just so I can get something that I can show you. So I decided to go back to my prototype and go through this. Now I'm using a condensed type, so a narrow, uh, tall, thin type. This is some printer's type that I bought from a bookbinder that was downsizing years ago and I'd never used it before. Uh, so that was great. I finally got to use this type. But I also found that I didn't have any spaces to go with it. But I did find some brass uh, spaces that would go with this. Now. For the original book, I used the blocking machine. Now I'm going to demonstrate using a hand chase. Now there's a few different types of hand chases. The one I'm going to use is the self-centering one, where I can do two lines at once. So the clamping mechanism um, comes in from the sides and from the top as well. The metal plate is the side that you sight down, so that's the top of the title. And type always has a nick on it so that you get the type all up the same way and it's on the uh, bottom of the letter. So I'll put the nicks up. 
the other type of hand chase are these two. They come in different sizes. This is the two smaller sizes, I think. So they it doesn't self-center, so you need to use spaces to uh, center the type. But there are advantages to using those, and I normally use those over the self-centering ones. The other thing I'll show you is brass bookbinders type, which is just beautiful to work with. You don't have to worry about melting it for a start, um, but it's super expensive. Uh, I don't own any, and this is on loan to me. But if you're one of those super rich bookbinders, then, um, uh, then that's what you would be working with. So let's set up the type in the hand chase. So let's open the book up so we can see the title. I've already picked out the type that I'm going to use and put it in the right order. I'll put some spaces either side um, to hold things in place. Um, and I was just sort of demonstrating that it's going to be a mirror image. And then you have to pack things out. If you're really uh, into your um, titling, uh, then you will use hair spaces to put between different letters to get the spacing really nice. Uh, my eye isn't great on that. Uh, I'll um, occasionally adjust stuff that looks grossly wrong, uh, but otherwise um, I'm normally trying to keep it as narrow, narrow as possible to fit on the book. I'll use some grey board to space out the lines. The grey board's nice in that it's got a bit of give so that if the type isn't uniformly thick, uh, it will allow for that and the type won't fall out when you turn it upside down. Once you have the title set up, then all the mucking around begins, uh, getting the two lines centered on each other, um, spacing out the two lines so they clamp properly, uh, adjusting any spacings between letters as I mentioned before. Now this self-centering hand chase isn't mine either, it's on loan from the Queensland Bookbinders Guild. And the one thing that I don't like about it is the pressure isn't even, uh, and it may be just because it's old and it's worn a bit, and so um, Getting the pressure on the two lines even is a little bit tricky. You don't want to over tighten it because that distorts the lines as well, which is a thing that I do all the time. I was going to cut a lot of this out because it is a bit tedious, but then you wouldn't understand that it can be a bit fiddly and time consuming getting this right. Now, obviously, I don't do this every single day, I don't do it an awful lot, and People that do are much, much faster than me. When you turn the chase over for the first time, make sure your hand is underneath it. Otherwise, if there is any loose type, it'll all, all fall out and you'll start again. Do a blind impression in some soft paper like blotting paper, which will let you know if there's any spelling mistakes or any big issues. And there are there, but I'll come back to that in a moment. This tool is a single line palette. It's got a flat side, which is the side that you sight down. Now, this tool was made locally by a bookbinder, an amateur bookbinder. He had a few of these made, so it's not made by one of the companies. Now, you hold it uh, in your right hand if you're right-handed with your thumb at the top. And I'm using it as a demonstration of what you can do with limited equipment. Uh, here's a, a roll. I think this was made locally as well. Again, it's got that flat side, which is the side that you sight down. Uh, I won't use the roll in this project, but I just wanted to show you two simple tools that uh, just these tools uh, allow you to do quite a lot. I'm going to use imitation gold foil. Now, foil comes in lots of different colors. We get given a lot of it from businesses that um, stop operating and have leftover stock. Uh, sometimes the original labels are on it, so we know what the foil was designed for if we look up the specifications, but sometimes we don't. So all you can do is uh, test it, uh, take some scraps, and experiment with the temperature, 
the dwell time and the pressure and see if you can get it to work for your purpose or you just go out and buy some uh, new stuff that's uh, designed for working on leather or cloth depending on what you're working on. I've also swapped to my cheap stove and this is the sort of setup most people have these days. This is an induction stove with a steel plate on it. I got that steel plate for something like $10. The induction stove I got from Kmart for $30 I think. Um, the induction stoves are nice because they heat up very fast but the uh, ordinary uh, hot plates are good in that they take up less space. So uh, up to you which one you want to use and you don't have to get the steel plate uh, with the ordinary hobs. The induction stoves also have a really noisy fan in them. While the tools are heating up, I'll make a template for cutting out the label. So I'm going to use a bit of card and cut out the size of the label that I want. So I'm just using dividers to transfer those measurements. Now I'm not going to demonstrate preparing the leather for a label. There's a really good video uh, on the Guild of Bookworkers Standards of Excellence series of Stuart Brockman uh, making a label. So I highly recommend that and following his approach to uh, preparing the leather. Um, I'm going to blame my annoyance at finding myself out of the leather I wanted to use because I didn't even bother pairing it. Um, but I normally would pair it fairly thin and then back it with paper. I didn't. I was just lazy and didn't bother. For some reason the temperature control on this stove is next to useless so I'm just going to test uh, the tool to see if I've got it up to temperature. Now I use a, a leather glove on my left hand when I'm working with hot tools. Some people just have a little cover for their thumb. Uh, I just can't bring myself to ruin a glove. So I'm giving this a go and I'll find that the tool is still a little bit on the cold side. Actually I cut that out. The tool temperature was good uh, by this point but I was having a problem with the G. I end up swapping the G out then the C. Uh, I did a couple other things to finally get something to sort of work. All right now I'm using my scrap of leather to see if I can uh, get a usable label. I'll normally do a couple or three um, and that's what I'm going to do and then I'll pick the best one. Uh, obviously if you missed Stuart Brockman you get it right first time especially if you're doing it on the book. Uh, I'm sorry I get in the way of this but uh, when you put the tool down try and put it down flat and then wiggle it up down side to side and then up. Of course the best impression was the one that was really close to the edge of the leather but I got lucky and was able to use it. Now I'll cut that out and then I'll just do a quick little edge pair on the label uh, as a token effort and then I'll stick it on the book. There was an interesting question recently on one of the Facebook groups. Someone asked what set of tools should a beginner get? Now Glenn Malkin gave an excellent answer to this. He suggested that you just buy the tools you need them as you need them. So I think a really good starting point would be a single line palette. You can do quite a lot with it and it gets you started and then you can decide what other tools you need. But if you just start buying tools you'll find you'll end up with a lot of tools that you'll never use and they're rather expensive. And if you're just starting out, I think it's best to avoid used tools. A lot of used tools are very worn and don't leave sharp impressions. And they're not really that cheap. So let's uh, put some lines on the cover of this book. So I'm going to protect the text block with a pressing tin. Cut a piece of foil to the length of the book. Now I'm going to use this little jig or tool. It's a piece of card that I've cut a strip off about an inch wide and hinged it with a bit of uh, magic tape or just sticky tape. 
So I can position that where I want to put the line and then I'm able to lift that up and put the foil underneath it. So I've just polished the tool up on a piece of rough leather with a bit of brass on it. So now I'll lift that up, put the foil in position and then run the hot tool along the edge. I almost forgot to test it to check that the temperature is right. A nice thing with this technique is that you can lift the uh, flap up and check the impression and if you're not happy with it uh, you can uh, just move the foil over and do it again. Which is what I'm going to do here. Uh, I think the tool was still a bit cool but I was a bit impatient which really isn't a good thing with finishing. Something I forgot to get a bit of a video of was uh, real gold foil. Boy, I'm really uh, holding on for dear life to that tool. I must be nervous because I'm not a, a great finisher. Um, real gold foil is much, much more expensive than fake foil. So it has real gold on it. It's much narrower. It's normally half an inch, an inch max wide. I did a workshop with Dominic Riley last year called Creative Gold Tooling and I bought some real gold foil from him then. Uh, he was selling uh, rolls uh, for a pretty good price I think. Uh, it was $130 Australian for 100 feet and that was I think it was 10 millimeters wide. So you, you uh, really don't want to waste that compared to uh, fake fo gold foil. In Dominic's course he takes you through making a little tool sort of like a three millimeter palette. It's a tiny little tool and then you can take a design and then break it up into sections into curves and straights and make lots of little versions of this hinged um, cardboard template and you do a little uh, piece for each part of the design and then you work your way around that design. It's a really good course, I highly recommend it. So the final thing I'll do is put some lines across the spine. Now no one's taught me this, I've just worked this out for myself so I may be doing it wrong, but I normally cite the tool on the left hand side of the tool but I want to hold the foil in position with my left hand so I need to work on the left hand side of the band and I want the flat side of the tool uh, up against the band. I, I don't want that um, overhanging part of the tool to touch the band. So then I have to sight say, say on the right hand side. At the ends I'll just use a piece of card as a guide and because I end up doing this at an angle for the camera, I end up getting it slightly crooked. So that's my excuse anyway. I almost forgot one of the lines. Finishing is a bit of a tricky business. Uh, you can't really expect to get it right the first time. So the first time you're doing it shouldn't be on a book. You really need to practice a bit. There may be some gifted people out there, and I wish I was one of them, but I'm not. Uh, so just maybe wrap some leather around an old book and put it in the press and use that to practice on. Um, make some uh, plaquettes up, so just bits of grey board uh, with some leather glued on it uh, as fake covers for practice as well. Uh, but do plenty of practice. It, it takes, it makes it less stressful when it comes time to doing it on a book. If you watch a professional or an accomplished finisher work, You'll often see them rock the tool from side to side as they work and the idea is to um, provide a glint to the gold. It's sort of like facets on a diamond so that from whatever angle you're looking at the book you'll get a direct reflection. The last thing I'll do is to put some uh, Hewitt's dressing on the leather and once that's dry, I'll buff that up with some soft cotton and then the book is finished. 
I do have a, a video ready for next week. However, thanks to my corrupted video files, I'm very behind on projects. As the projects have become more uh, complex, uh, I have found it harder to uh, keep up this weekly schedule. So after next week, I am going to drop back to a video every two weeks just for uh, the sustainability of the channel. I'm also struggling to keep up with comments and emails. So I'm very sorry if it's taken me a while to get back to you. Uh, I will continue to respond to all questions. However, I am also looking at uh, either Patreon or YouTube membership where I can provide more focused or detailed support. So that's it for this week. Uh, as always, I really appreciate you hitting the big thumbs up if you've enjoyed the video. If you want to be notified of my future videos, please hit the subscribe button. And until next time, cheerio.